Happy Friday, fellow conservatives. It's another edition of CPAC Live. As promised, Matt Schlapp had a chance to sit down with Senator Mike Lee, the conservative senator, the senior senator from the great state of Utah. Enjoy this interview here. Uh, it's our great honor at CPAC Live to be sitting down with the senator with the highest lifetime ACU rating, Senator Mike Lee, Republican of Utah. Senator Lee, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much, Matt. Good to be with you. Uh, it's, you know, we were able to go down to Sao Paulo in Brazil and you were showing off because you spoke basically every language uh, that people were speaking in the room, including Portuguese. But we're going to keep this to English today, okay? That's fine with me. That'll work. Uh, boy, a lot's happened uh, since our international travels with CPAC, where we went to five uh, different countries. Um, and we're looking at, you know, we, we, for instance, went to Hong Kong and saw protesters trying to hold on to freedom. And now, at this moment in America, it's almost like the mirror image. You have protesters trying to rip down the very concept of the most freedom-loving country uh, people have ever seen. Um, what's your perspective on what's happening? You know, Matt, I, I tend to think that we're witnessing uh, one of the biggest attacks on the First Amendment in our lifetime. Uh, across the country, you've got progressive Democrats who are hostile to people of faith and to faith itself, trying to ban peaceful gatherings of worship, including even gatherings with masks and with social distancing, all in the name of public health. But meanwhile, these same progressive Democrats are allowing Black Lives Matter protesters and other people bent on uh, mob violence to gather in any size at any time with absolutely no requirement that they wear masks or that they socially distance. Now, this is exactly the type of discrimination, the uh, type of discriminatory persecution that our founding fathers sought to protect us against when they drafted and ratified the First Amendment. This ought to concern us. So, um, you know, uh, we always come to you uh, and to Senator Cruz and a couple of the other spectacular lawyers who the smart voters in different states have decided to send to the Senate to try to get a historical uh, idea of what's happening. You know, it seems like history is dead. We're, we don't want to have anything to do with history because history is riddled with people that weren't perfect, didn't, uh, didn't exhibit every single virtue every moment of every day. But when our founders came up with this idea of a constitution and then the follow on with the Bill of Rights, um, we're always told that there was a bit of neutrality. It, there's, a, there's, a, there's an idea that the, the state doesn't establish a church. They can't make you worship. You can decide not to be a believer. But you have the full authority to use the, you know, to worship as you believe to the full extent. At what point, have we ever had another point in American history where literally having faith is discriminated against, not having faith is encouraged? No, uh, certainly not like this one. And we haven't seen that dynamic because it hasn't existed as a cultural phenomenon on any widespread basis until very recently. And in fact, until very recently, uh, polling and, and, and public sentiment generally reflected a view that religious freedom was a good thing that religious pluralism was a good thing. Even though we haven't always lived up to respecting each other's religious differences as well as we should have as Americans, there has at least been a widespread belief that, that worshiping and believing in God was a good thing that brought benefits to society. Only recently has it become somewhat controversial in some circles, especially in circles of people who are affirmatively opposed to persons of faith and to worship and religious expression itself. Uh, you're a member of the LDS Church. I think what you're referring to perhaps is uh, members of this church uh, faced very fierce persecution for their beliefs. And once again, a member of the LDS community could look back on that and say, that tells you America is a crummy place. Or somebody in 21st century America who's a member of this community or just respectful of this community can look back at that and say, look where we've come. This is the place where the church prospered. America is a very tolerant place. I have a feeling I know which one, which, which choice you choose to make. 
Yeah, Matt, members of my church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, have endured a lot of persecution in our history. On October 27, 1837, uh, the governor of Missouri ordered us to be driven from the state or in the alternative, exterminated. And uh, we, we endured persecution in, in Missouri, in Ohio, uh, and in Illinois. And ultimately we fled to the Rocky Mountains and settled Utah where we were finally able to live in peace after some additional persecution. Um, nonetheless, religious freedom in America has allowed us to worship in peace. And you know, for, for many decades now, we've been able to live and operate in the world and we've been able to uh, move forward and, and to move beyond what happened. It, that is not to say that all forms of discrimination are equal or that uh, other people haven't endured worse things than members of my faith did, but healing is possible. We can move forward, we can do better, and there are many examples in our history that remind us of that. So uh, specifically on this question of what we're reading about that uh, these types of what I would consider religious atrocities and religious persecution in a modern context in states like California, where the governor and others in his administration are, are, are calling out people that would actually consider having a Bible study in their house and saying that that would be uh, a, a, a risk to having a super spreading effect with uh, Chinese corona. Uh, when you see people, uh, governors saying, uh, you know, church attendance of more than 10 people is a health danger and must be prevented, but yet you see riots, literally riots going on uh, in their major cities and uh, they do nothing. Matter of fact, they pull the police back. Uh, what's a conservative to think when they look at these scenes going on in their country? Well, conservatives look to the Constitution in moments like these and they're reminded of the fact that the Constitution makes a distinction. When a, a state imposes a uniform mandate, a, a, a health-related penalty for certain conduct, for example, that's one thing. But if, on the other hand, the state is imposing a set of restrictions on religious conduct that are not equally applied to secular or non-religious conduct, then you've got a problem. That's a constitutional violation. That's the type of violation we saw, for example, in Kentucky, uh, where uh, exceptions were made for secular, uh, non-religious purposes, but not for religious purposes. That's a problem. Well, and uh, Attorney General Barr has uh, been stepping in on these questions of when there's an unequal treatment between religious practices and other practices. And I think that might be an easier case or, or a more obvious case for which the government should step in and, and prevent this type of uh, uh, civil rights violation from happening. But, but I wanna tease this out a little more. What power in our constitutional order can a governor prevent us from doing almost anything uh, in the, if he can wrap it, he or she can wrap it in uh, health concerns, even if many of us view this as the politicization of health concerns? They shouldn't be able to. Now, depending on the state constitution at issue, a governor may have a fair amount of authority under state law. Uh, it still remains the case that not everything can be justified as a health order. And most things that can be used and frequently have been used in order to shut down religious gatherings, for example, are being employed in a way that is anything but even handed. There's almost always an accompanying constitutional violation where they're discriminating specifically against religious conduct. This brings up another point, Matt, for the conservatives need to remember. Um, as I often say when describing threats to religious freedom, uh, when the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man from the first Ghostbusters movie steps on your church, it's not necessarily that he's singled out your church and your religious beliefs uh, for punishment. It's that he's the giant Stay Puft Marshmallow Man and he's 10 stories tall and your church happens to be in his path. That's like government. The bigger it gets, the clumsier it gets and the more reckless it becomes with regard to your freedoms generally and your religious liberty in particular. Uh, I'm trying to figure out who could be the modern uh, equivalent of the Stave Puff Marshmallow Man. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, my conscience is telling me I, I probably should leave that one alone. But the, uh, 
it's safe to just say it's the federal government generally. <laughs> okay. I was thinking of some governors. But anyway, um, so now you have this question. You're a member of the LDS community. I'm uh, a Roman Catholic. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of uh, Christian churches, non-denominational, private uh, churches, religious, uh, excuse me, schools, religiously affiliated schools. And you have the governors coming in and saying, uh, as they did in the state of Kansas, uh, my home state, the governor, the Democratic governor out of nowhere decided, you know what, we probably should get some masks and some uh, PPE pulled together. And she said, you know, we didn't really think about that until now. So now we're going to delay the schools a month. And now the Catholic bishops and these Christian pastors, you know, there's this assumption that the governor shuts down the public schools. What is the avenue for private schools who are independent of the state? Some are accredited by the state. Some choose not to be because state accreditations now come with all of the junk of the anti-American uh, curriculums. That uh, That is one of the reasons why we have young, radicalized white kids in our cities starting fires uh, and fomenting violence. So what is the, if you're a religious, let's say you were a pastor and, uh, and you lived in a blue state and the governor was saying you must shut down your school, what would be your next step if you believed your congregation and your pupils could open up in a safe way? Okay, so Matt, my, my first question uh, to the governor would be, on what authority do you order me to be shut down? Because if I'm operating a religious school, it's not an arm of the state. It's not an arm of any political subdivision of the state. It's not funded by the state. Uh, and in most instances, it won't even receive any state assistance of any kind. So on what authority does the governor do this? One of the things that we've always got to ask as, cons as conservatives is well, what the source of authority for any government action is. Now, I think in many instances, governors are acting way outside of their authority when they purport to have the the power to shut down public schools even. But when it gets to private and religious schools, that's an entirely separate layer, a separate set of reasons why they probably don't have the power to do that. I'd be very skeptical from the outset of their ability to do that. And I would also couple it with the fact that the minute you start doing that, you, you're necessarily stepping in on somebody's ability to practice their religion. It, it is impossible to practice most forms of Christianity, most forms of monotheism that I'm familiar with for that matter, without routinely gathering with other people. And it's impossible to practice uh, these same religious beliefs, any of a whole variety of them, without some form of instruction, religiously and otherwise. That's none of the state's darn business, and we've got to keep the state out of it. And apparently singing kills, so I'm learning new things about uh... Uh, about this modern predicament we're in. One final question, Senator, because we know you've got to get back uh, to important business, although we do consider this important business too. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we've seen these young kids of color, young black kids who have been murdered, killed uh, in the violence that, have, that is happening, the ongoing violence of Chicago, but the violence that has happened uh, in Minneapolis and New York City and so many of our major cities. Uh, I saw a grandmother on the TV the other day who was going to sue uh, the local authorities and the mayor because of the death of her grandson. She's a, a black woman and he was a black young man and his death is a tragedy. For these people that are, are seeing paying the ultimate price because of the violence perpetrated by these left-wing radicalized socialists, Marxists, you pick the name, un-American, trying to destroy American, funded, unfortunately, by a lot of uh, people in elite society because they think they might be helping something racially, but actually what's resulting in is a lot of harm to the black community. Are they suing the wrong people in these cases generically? Uh, you know, should, should it be about the victims of these crimes suing the municipalities? And maybe that's fair because they've pulled the police back. But what about the actual entities that are encouraging all the violence? At what point can America kind of throttle back on this idea that our political differences should erupt in flames in our cities. Yeah, uh, look, you always have to look at who is most immediately responsible for the action. To turn a, a blind eye ever to the immediate perpetrators of a crime, instead to try to blame someone else, a, a third party, who may or may not have acted with any criminal or civil uh, culpability or liability, uh, distracts from the attention that needs to be drawn 
toward those who are deliberately organizing these illegal activities. Look, we have the right peaceably to assemble and to speak our minds. That right does not encompass the right to inflict physical harm on other people or their property. It just doesn't. They're pretending as if it did. I found it amusing to see so many people in the media uh, suggesting that uh, protests um, are expected to be violent and that the protection accompanying them uh, doesn't disappear if you're being violent. And that's simply absurd and it's indefensible in terms of the Constitution. Yeah, absolutely. And we appreciate your words and we appreciate all you do in the Senate. We appreciate your conservative voice. We most especially uh, the instruction and the advice you get from your most important advisor, and that's your wife, Sharon, who is often talking to my most important advisor, my wife, Mercy. So we've got uh, we've got a lot of people on our side and we appreciate all of you. Thanks for being with us on CPAC Live, Senator Mike Lee. Thanks so much, man. All right. Take it easy. Thank you. I, I, I want to be clear in how I characterize this. This is a, mostly a protest. Uh, it is not. Uh, it is not generally speaking unruly. But fires have been started, and and there's a crowd that. Is- and welcome back to another edition of CPAC Live. It gives me great pleasure to bring to our CPAC Live audience the editor in chief of National Review, Rich Lowry. Rich, how are you this afternoon? I'm good. How are you? Uh, We're very well here in uh, Washington, D.C. One of the news items that we've been following closely on this show are the 50 plus days of outrage and riots happening there in Portland, Oregon, which I always thought was a uh, a predominantly white city. But they have decided that that the BLM Inc. is the uh, cause of the season. Um, Let me ask you what you make of it. Is this really, you hear a lot of conservatives saying that this BLM movement, the the, the way that the money is moving and their goals that they've stated, uh, reflect uh, an attempt to bring about a Marxist revolution uh, here in the United States. That's pretty strong language. Do you agree with that characterization? Well, I think they want to overturn our understanding of America. I don't think they're classically Marxist, you know, that they they don't want the dictatorship of the proletariat, but they are beholden to this so-called anti-racist ideology, which is explicitly a discriminatory ideology. And the, the idea is to replace our race ne- neutral and colorblind laws with uh, um, race conscious uh, laws that discriminate against the, the so-called oppressors. And Portland is a pro- predominantly white city, but it's also predominantly an Antifa city. And that, that's what we've seen on the ground there for uh, months now. And it's totally legal for federal, in fact, required of federal forces to defend federal property. And the reason why this en- enhanced presence took place around July 4th weekend, there was intelligence that the federal courthouse there was going to be subjected to even more aggressive attack. That intelligence turned out to be true. And you have these agents there when, when an agent is attacked or the property is uh, defaced or attacked, they'll try to identify a particular individual involved and they'll arrest them. And if they're wrong, they'll release the person. The person, when they're arrested, they're taken into the courthouse, they're read their rights. This is a totally legal and proportionate uh, operation. And the idea that the mayor of Portland and Nancy Pelosi and others want to make it into a Gestapo operation is totally disgraceful. Before I uh, uh, we get into uh, Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler, um, I want to focus on what you what you just said right there, that the left has sort of characterized this perfectly constitutional and legal use of force to protect federal property uh, as somehow akin to, you said, Gestapo, uh, as akin to what they do in North Korea where uh, or, or the Chinese Communist Party or what's on the verge of happening in Hong Kong where uh, those who dissent with the established order just disappear. They may go to prison. Uh, Maybe the family disappears as well. Uh, These are gross, uh, not just civil, but human rights um, abuses. It sounds like that these federal uh, agents, um, as you said, they're reading the rights and they drop them off at the police station and say, hey, don't burn down that building. Um, what's your sense of whether whether there's ever going to be a distinction? Are, are the folks on the left are going to they're just going to keep pushing this totally unrealistic version of what's happening uh, to no end? Is there any chance of reaching them and, and and getting them to think a little bit differently and compromise perhaps about what's happening in order to find 
uh, uh, you know, peace and calm in the streets there? Or is it no. rioting forever? <laughs> no, it's, it's going to be a defensive rioting uh, forever. And look, th this, the, the image of this created in the media, it's, it's another case of, you know, we live in an era of viral videos, and viral videos, videos can often be uh, deceiving. And we saw that most, most starkly in the case of the, the Covington kids. But so you've had two videos or so of uh, what looks like a, a guy just walking down the sidewalk and all of a sudden these huge, you know, camouflage troops run after him and grab him and throw him into an unlocked vehicle. Um, so what, what's happened is that guy is suspected of lazing officers, you know, trying to get a laser in their eye to damage their eyes or throwing things, objects at them or setting a fire. And because there's this huge mob around the courthouse, they don't wade into the mob and try to grab the guy which will be bad for the guy, dangerous for the guy, dangerous for the officers, dangerous for the crowd. It'll create even, even uh, more of a melee. So they, they try to uh, observe him and watch him get separated a little bit. And then when he is, they'll say, hey, here, we're, we're officers from um, the CPB. You're, you're under arrest and we need to, to take you. Um, so, but, but it's made out as though this just random guy is not bothering anyone. He's uh, totally peaceful. He just happens to be walking down the streets and, and, and these stormtroopers descend on him, which is not happening. And just the other night when Mayor Wheeler was at, at the site, you saw everyone knows who these troops are, right? <laughs> they're the bad guys. You know, there's not a doubt of, of what agency they're from. They're throwing stuff at them. They're targeting them. So um, they, they don't have their names because there have been instances of doxing. They don't have marked vehicles, because if they, as soon as the, the mob saw a, a federal vehicle, they try to destroy it and overturn it and burn it, which, again, is not good for the officers. It's not good for the mob, which would have to be pushed aside. So they're using unmarked vehicles, both of which the, the lack of a name tag and the unmarked vehicles are totally legal. So this is a complete smear of this operation. And the guys who... They don't want to be there. No one wants to be in Portland. They're not in any other city, right? It's in, they're only in Portland because the federal courthouse has been repeatedly targeted. The footage that I've seen has them being very gingerly escorted to mom's minivan uh, and then <laughs> driven off in fairly civilized uh, fashion. Um, Ted Wheeler has described these protests as peaceful. He went and uh, marched in lockstep with a number of them earlier this week. Uh, did you find any irony that he went out there with his security detail among the mob of peaceful protesters? Oh, of course. And uh, you know, there's a, I, I tweeted about this yesterday. There is a local reporter who has a, about a, a tweet thread, maybe a do dozen videos of Wheeler's trip into the mob. And I urge people to go find it, watch every single bit of it. Because the first thing he does, he hasn't done anything wrong. He's just walking towards the courthouse. And some goon comes up and dumps at his feet all this broken glass, you know, which is basically all you need to know about a lot of the characters in this crowd. Then he goes to the front of the line, you know, in front of the courthouse. And there's tear gas because there's a huge mob there. And he gets theatrically tear gassed and he, he tells people this is the worst thing that's ever happened. It's totally unjustified. And meanwhile, you see these guys, black clad guys with helmets behind him, violently trying to take down the security fence, shooting fireworks at the courthouse, throwing objects at the at the uh, officers and trying to laze them. And, you know, he barely gets back into I don't know what municipal building he retreated to with the help of the security guys. But there's no way, no matter what he says publicly, there's no way he was not thinking to himself, these people are crazy and a menace. <laughs> and uh, he, he may not be able to say that uh, or want to say that, but it's true. And the federal government has to act accordingly. What's the, what's the politics for somebody like Ted Wheeler, who, of course, is a politician? I presume he went out there in the street. It was a political move in a town like Portland. Uh, uh, it's good politics to beat up uh, on, on the executive branch. It's good politics to beat up on Donald Trump. Um, but it seems like that a lot of the folks who are in the street that he thought he would be able to bond with yeah. uh, and form friendships and, 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 and su supporters among the, uh, the Antifa folks, they want his head, too. Uh, yeah. He's he's caught in this very difficult position of, of of being a man without a constituency. How's how's what's what do you think his political thinking is? What's the calculus? Well, it, 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 as you say, I think political thinking is just um, to to do the most he can to demonstrate his 
four square opposition to the federal government protecting this, this piece of federal property. But it, it was very uh, reminiscent of the Minneapolis mayor, I forget his name at the moment, but the guy who goes, goes to the struggle Jacob session. Frank. Yeah, he goes to the struggle session and uh, uh, to, to try to, to co-opt the mob, be part of the mob. And they're like, are you gonna defund the police? And nah, I don't think that's such a great idea. And boo, get out of here, shame, shame. It was very much that kind of uh, dynamic. And what, what I think so, explains so much of what's going on uh, today, generally at the New York Times, at other institutions, on, uh, with, in the case with these mayors, these are upstanding liberal people who, you know, at the end of the day, they're fairly reasonable. Um, but they're used to the idea that they're always on the right side of history and they have no enemies on the left. So you have a mob on the left, you have millennial editors at the New York Times saying, you're the problem now, you're part of the establishment, and they have no defense against that. They can't say, no, you're wrong, no, you're crazy, no, you're irrational. So they get pushed by the most uh, virulent and radical uh, element on their own side. And I just don't see that dynamic changing anytime soon. You're describing this sort of uh, cancel culture as the uh, as the nom de jour. Uh, I think it was earlier this week on Twitter where there were a lot of activists on the left saying, no, we just call it culture. We don't want to call it cancel culture. This is just the culture that we want to uh, 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 bring about and make it part of um, American culture. Uh, I also read, I think, uh, David Brooks this morning that uh, cited a poll, maybe Cato Institute did it, that said that the progressive left is 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 far more uh, comfortable being vocal than conservatives these days. That you know, if you want to express your opinion and exhibit your First Amendment rights, that progressives are free to do so in this kind of atmosphere, but that conservatives, uh, uh, you know, out of fear, a perfectly reasonable fear of being fired. Yeah from their job or having a brick dropped in their head should they walk around the wrong corner with the wrong message or wearing uh, uh, the red hat um, uh, are really uh, quite, you know, cowed into silence. Uh, yeah. what, do you, what, do you, what do you make of that, you know, conservatives not being able to take advantage of the fir their First Amendment right to speak freely? Well, a couple things. It's, it's totally true. And you're right. Conservatives, unfortunately, should be scared. I mean, uh, I would say don't be scared, but there's there's reason to be scared. The Washington, our friends of the Washington Free Beacon had a report this week about a, I believe, it was a high school gym teacher. And I don't know whether he tweeted it or posted on Instagram or Facebook or something, but literally said, "Trump is our president." This is a factual statement. This is not a controversial statement. This is not a statement uh, me meant to stir people up. And he was fired. You know, so it's it's not just it's one thing. You know, if a Barry Weiss, an editor at the New York Times feels uncomfortable and, and has to leave. That's terrible. It's a really bad sign of what's happening at the Times, but she'll be fine, right? She's gonna write a book. She'll start some other publication. This guy, it's his livelihood, you know? And how long is it gonna take him to get a new job? Does he have a young family? Do we, do we know? And he had no idea that just saying something like that would bring the world crashing down around his head. That's a really distressing um, part of our, our national life at the moment. And the left will say, well, look, it's just, it's just, <coughs> we just do, you do your speech and then we do our speech criticizing you. There's something to that. But th this is really like McCarthyism because McCarthyism in the 50s, it wasn't, it was somewhat a government phenomenon, but not really. It was just uh, ho Hollywood studios wouldn't hire you if uh, they suspected you of being a, a communist. So it was a private phenomenon. And I think that's what's, what's really been remarkable here. This isn't government driving this really at all. It is private institutions, very much including shameful sectors of corporate America, who are enforcing this new orthodoxy. And it's extremely threatening uh, to people. And it's, it's profoundly against the spirit of the First Amendment. We're speaking with Rich Lowry, the <laughs> editor in chief of, uh, of National Review, a publication that uh, so many folks my age uh, grew up reading. It was, uh, it was the Buckley Bible. Um, and uh, when I was growing up, it was it was required reading um, among me and my friends, and it was a somewhat uh, a narrow viewpoint. It was all conservative all the time, and it was wonderful, and it was provocative. Um, but it is almost as if the world has has turned topsy turvy, where uh, diversity of thought and opinion is really found at National Review now, and some of the other more mainstream publications are much more narrow minded in their approach to. Uh, uh, the opinions that they want to share. When I give uh, the, the occasional speech 
uh, uh, folks will say to me, uh, boy, Ian, you gave me a great, I, you know, great vision on bias in media, but what can I do? And I say, well, you should support conservative publications. You should not be afraid to to, uh, to to pay for the subscription, to, to pay the money to get out of your paywall. Put your put your money where your mouth is if you believe in conservative media. What can our CPAC Live audience do as far as making sure that you're able to continue the good work uh, uh, that you do at National Review, continue that Buckley legacy, make sure that uh, Ramesh and Garrity uh, continue to write all of the great things that they do and you can keep the lights on. What can we do to help? Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. I love that question. Our publisher especially will love that question. But say you you nailed it and, and you're set up there. It's sign up, you know, uh, pay for what we we do. Uh, we've we've had a, a digital subscription program that we've been really leaning into it for about a year and a half or, or more. It's grown by leaps and bounds. We have tens of thousands of people signed up, and it's not a lot. You know, their first time offers any given moment five dollars a month or something like that. But this gives us a secure base. You know, I've talked to to Matt Schlapp about this. We can't defend, depend on corporate donors. National Review never has. We can't really depend on corporate advertisers. National Review, you know, we have some of that, not a lot. We need like-minded people to donate and subscribe to our institutions, to make them these fortified institutions and islands in our culture that can't be canceled. And the way to do that with National Review is just to, to log in and subscribe. It takes five minutes. It's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. It's really, really important to us. Folks, I can't tell you how important it is to do that should National Review uh, 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 not make it. The conservative movement will not make it. They are intertwined uh, with with one another. And uh, one more plug for uh, the book that you wrote recently, The Case for Nationalism, How It Made Us Powerful, United, and Free. Rich, how can people pick up this important read? Oh, well, uh, go order it on, on Amazon, uh, but uh, just make the basic case. Nationalism even though it has uh, toxic connotations and is considered, considered a, a nasty word in a lot of places. It created the modern world. It's the basis of, of democracy. It's one of the elements that made uh, America great. So uh, I, I think it's uh, impossible to understand our world and what's going on without grappling with nationalism. I'm sure I'm making this like the uh, lightning round at the yeah. end of some uh, silly NPR show or something. Uh, one last uh, uh, comment on the renaming of the Washington football team, which you wrote about earlier this week, Rich. Oh, it's pathetic. It's just pathetic. I mean, no one. I'm not. I'm, I grew up in the Washington area. I'm a, Res, I'm a Redskins hater, though. <laughs> But uh, the Redskins, no one thinks that this is a way to like refer to Native Americans. It's just that it's only used in the context of the Washington Redskins football team. It's a great tradition. The Burgundy and Gold works. The fight song works. It unites Redskins fans of all ages and colors and creeds. And no one really was offended by it. No one, except for people who make it their professional business to be offended. I think there was a recent poll saying like 29% of people supported uh, the name change. So it was ridiculous that this was dumped. And But then I, I think, you know, kind of very telling that they, they've settled on the safest option for the time being, which is having no name. Because <laughs> if you really take this logic seriously, we'd have to eliminate the Pirates, you know, the Texas Rangers. There's actually a New York Times or Washington Post op-ed saying the Rangers have to go. Everything would be offensive if you really go down this this lane. And, and everything would have to be, you know, the New York baseball team and the, the Tennessee football team and on and on, and it just would make our, our sports more monochromatic and eliminate all the charm from it. But that's what a lot of people do want to do with their woke bulldozer running through our culture. I presume it's only a matter of time before they pull down the uh, statues of uh, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig at Yankee Stadium. Rich Lowry, thank you so much for joining us and taking some hey, time it, out man. of your busy schedule to join us on CPAC really Live. Thanks. God bless everyone. See you next time. That was a powerful interview from uh, Mike Lee at the top of this show and a lot of fun to get to catch up with our friend Rich Lowry from National Review. Uh, a couple thoughts heading into the uh, weekend, folks. I spent some time this week welcoming and prepared to welcome sports back into uh, back into our media diet. I watched a little bit of NBA. It's totally unwatchable. They're putting out a terrible product. And it, it, it occurred to me that NBA is supposed to stand for National Basketball Association. I just didn't realize that the nation that they were supporting and catering to was actually the Chinese Communist Party. I thought it was an American sport, uh, but it's become clear that the American audience is not 
uh, what's going on here. Uh, Free Hong Kong, if you know what I'm saying, put that on the jerseys, uh, 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 folks, if they'll allow you to do so. I got to watch a little bit of baseball this week. The Nationals opened up uh, their season. The West Coast teams opened up their season. Um, and the interesting thing about baseball, folks, is it's often reflected uh, the realities of American history. Baseball, if you want to talk about systemic racism, uh, was a whites-only sport for the longest time. You had the Negro Leagues, which were separate uh, baseball leagues and not the big leagues, not the major leagues. It was a segregated sport for the longest time. And who came along and did it? But that wonderful man that Matt Schlapp and I talk about a lot for the Brooklyn Dodgers, Jackie Robinson, who crossed that color line. Um, the Jackie Robinson story is one worth remembering. He absorbed the abuse of not just the fans uh, when he came into the league in the 1950s, but also the abuse of uh, lots of Major League Baseball players who were not happy about the, the sport becoming integrated. Um, he handled it with dignity. He handled it with class. And what he did was he let his athleticism do the talking. One of the greatest baseball players ever to play the game, the way he swung the bat, he opened the door for Roy Campanella, for Willie Mays, and for an integrated Major League Baseball season. Um, it broke my heart to see the New York Yankees uh, taking a knee during the national anthem yesterday. And the, the league that's going to start taking the knee again is the NFL. Um, in Washington, as Rich alluded to, we've decided to change the name of my beloved Washington Redskins um, it, to the Washington football team. Uh, what does that mean? I'm not quite sure. But what I do know is that not one single income of an African-American person in America is going to increase because of the name change. I know that not one single life that has been lost in an urban area over the past four months is going to come back. Uh, this has seriously no impact um, on bettering the lives of any Americans, and yet here we are doing it. It really speaks to what's happening in corporate boardrooms um, and how they need to sell their products. A few years ago, it was going green was good business. Now it's doing the BLM Inc. thing is good business. They're going to put BLM on the jerseys. They'll put BLM on first base. Um, this doesn't do anything to improve anyone's lives, ladies and gentlemen. Sports, athleticism is supposed to transcend. It's supposed to bring people together as Americans. Here in Washington, D.C., the Washington Redskins were the team where Washingtonians came together. People of all stripes, of all colors, and all ages rooted for that team. And it didn't matter who you were. If you wore that burgundy and gold, uh, you were friends, you were part of a community. One of the heartbreaking things is as I've become a dad, I've tried to raise my girls with that same love of that football team, we're going to call them now. And they looked at that logo, and my oldest daughter says, Daddy, is that your friend? And I always said yes, looking at that proud image uh, of, the, uh, of, of the Native American. It was a dignified image. Um, but you know what I've occurred to is, is that we're all changing. America is changing. Um, my own heart is changing. I don't know if I'm going to watch NFL this year. It means I've wasted the past 25 years of my life watching this sport, uh, but I don't know that I can do it anymore. I'll keep you posted on it. And the more important thing to me these days is making sure that my daughters get to go to CPAC and they look at all of you guys there and they say, Mom, Dad, are those your friends? And I say, yeah, all those people at CPAC Live and that sit with us in that room and that come with us to our events, yeah, those are my friends. Those are the priorities that I'm going to fight for. Those are the ones that we're going to fight for here at the American Conservative Union. Uh, I hope you had a good time on CPAC Live. And join us again on Monday at 3.30 p.m. for another fun-filled, action-packed edition of CPAC Live, folks.